Everyone, thank you for subscribing to Philosophy's Vlog. I'm William Song, and this is Jeremy Sargent. Hi, well, nice to see you. Yeah. See you. Okay. Welcome. Thanks. So I'm at the Happy Monk uh, with Jeremy. Jeremy's the owner. Uh, and as you know, if you've been subscribing to us, uh, the Vlog is about getting to know local entrepreneurs in China, in Guangzhou, uh, and in region, really, in, in the greater, greater Bay Area. And we hope viewers will find these videos interactive in terms of understanding what it means to, 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 to be a startup, to be an entrepreneur, and also what it, what's life like in China as a, as a foreigner and um, in general, I guess. So um, over to you really, Jeremy. So again, thank you um, for this midday here in Guangzhou. I mean, the sun's booming. We just say, I know, we were just saying, you know, we miss, we miss London because in London there's lots of opportunities to sit out in the sun. And I when it's it, sunny, when, like when it's sunny, work, when it's sunny, and then the after work drinking culture. Absolutely. Too. So you've got a beer garden here as well. But before we go into all of that, Jeremy, just a quick introductions about who you are and what you do, Great. and then, then I'll, we'll, we'll get into it. Okay. Well, thanks, Will, and welcome to the Happy Month. Nice mm -hmm. to see you again. So, as you said, my name is Jeremy. Uh, I've been in China now for basically 20 years. Okay. Came here for six months, it became a year, it became five years, it became 20 okay. years. As it does. As it does. Wasn't planned that way. Okay. Uh, but it's been a great journey so far. Yeah. Really enjoyed it. You know, it has its ups and downs and its challenges, but overall it's been really positive. Excellent. Okay. So Jeremy, I mean, a lot of people know Jeremy, uh, not because of his size and his booming voice and his, his uh, boyish, boyish good looks, but yeah. people know you as the, the owner of the Happy Monk. And, and Happy Monk is a, a chain of restaurants, bars, uh, five now, but it's never always been the Happy Monk, has it, Jeremy? No, so when I came here back in 98, that's when I first moved to China, yeah. uh, I was a new, fresh, newly qualified solicitor with a UK law firm, okay. working in Hong Kong, just qualified. And one day my boss came up to me and said, oh, we're opening in China. Mm -hmm. Uh, young man, are you willing to go up north and see what you can do? That was my brief. Really? Honestly. Young Literally. man, are you yes. are you willing, willing to, to go up north? Yes. This guy was a sort of old, uh, elderly, sort of grandfatherly okay. type. type, type is he, is he going to dispute us when he sees us? No, on, I think he probably. Video. I don't think he. I don't think he, he probably won't recognise you. Yeah, yes. exactly. <laughs> so long ago. So that, that's how it really began. So I came up here initially for a six month posting okay. to, as he said, see what's going on up here and see whether the firm can do anything in Guangzhou. Okay. And, and bear in mind, Will, back then, Guangzhou was not exactly number one on the desirability list yes. as a place to live or even visit. It was hard to get people to come here then. Okay. For me, when I arrived, it was a totally different world uh -huh. uh, and it was exciting. I mean, the whole city was one big construction site. It was nutty and frenetic, and the metro hadn't been built, but yeah. the, 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 over, the overpasses were being built, so there was traffic everywhere, the air quality was awful. So how long had you been in Hong Kong before you came here? Because it must have been a massive... It was a massive gap, yeah. Uh, so Hong Kong, I'd been, I'd been in Hong Kong when I was younger at school, but then come back, uh, I'd been in Hong Kong for uh, about three years. Okay. But I'd been working for two years. Okay, yeah. young whippersnapper. Can't, well, I wasn't that young because I started everything late in life. Okay. Well, not everything, but lots of things. I thought he was growing with a beard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so I went back to university when I was in my mid 20s. Right. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, so I only qualified as a solicitor when I was age 29. Okay. 30 actually. Okay. So I came here when I was 30, just turned 32. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Give, give away your age now. Sorry. Okay. <coughs> Nothing like a, a, a good pint of beer to wash down a coffee. Eh? Uh, that's right. So yeah, so that's how it all started. It wasn't planned. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I spent the first eight years at the firm here in China. Okay. Uh, uh, basically building up the office from scratch. Uh, and later we expanded to a Shanghai office as well. And I was kind of commuting backwards and forwards. Between Shanghai and Guangzhou. Shanghai and Guangzhou. Okay. Uh, and it was exciting. There was, you know, at that time, a lot of foreign companies were coming into the China market, mm -hmm. and they needed a lot of hand holding. So there was a, there was an element of being in the right place at the right time. Okay, uh, they needed a lot of help. Uh, you know, China, from a perspective of a foreign company coming here to set up a business, can be difficult. It's a bit of a maze, particularly back then. I think things are a little bit easier now. But okay, as as a as a foreign company in, in Guangzhou. Yeah, okay. yeah. 
Okay. So that's how it all began, and then the Happy Monk came in 2009. And this is this is the first this one. This is the first one. We're sitting in the very first one. Okay. Was um, this here before? So I don't remember this part. Of it. Was it this? But this bit was added about okay. three years ago. Yeah. So uh, I remember coming here. The part was just what we see in there. Yeah. So I came in 2014, and oh, okay. I remember I remember it very clearly because I, I was out in the beer garden, and there was a wedding proposal, a marriage proposal right inside. Right. 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 And uh, as I was proposing, I was dying for a. a Toilet and the toilet's just around the corner, and, and, and yeah, it was all new to me. I came back and everyone was crying and celebrating. I kind of missed it, but so you know, memories like that, you know. And, and then when your second one popped up, uh, and then your third, and, and you know, recently your fifth one in party beer. So, so what's driving the happy monk to go from one to five? Because it, it's a brand, everyone knows it's a brand. It's a, small, it's a small brand, it's a growing brand. I think one really important thing, and this is what I'd probably say to any. Anyone trying to build a, a particularly branded business here in the China market is, you know, don't run until you can walk, yeah, and don't walk until you really stop crawling. And I think that's what we did. So when we when we started here, we weren't experienced in the F and B business at all. Yeah, it was all new. We were headless chickens, uh, but over time, the pieces started to fall into place quite well. Okay. We stuck to some fundamental principles from okay. day one, which were. Well, I think one is being true to your brand, and I know that sounds really obvious, but I think... It sounds quite cliche, right? But it's... It, it sounds really cliche, but back then, particularly, and even now to some extent in China, as you know, well, uh, a lot of people will take shortcuts. There's quite a short-term yeah. view of trying to make money, yeah. and we decided not to take the shortcuts, and things like, for example, not relying on third-party brand products on yeah. our part. Yeah. We wanted to create our own brand, so if yeah. you look around, yeah. Whether it's the beer mats, whether it's the beer taps, chandeliers. whether it's the chandeliers, whatever you see, it's original. Yeah, uh, we're not, you know, jumping into bed with a big beer company who will then provide all our marketing collateral, brand everywhere. Like a lot of bars are still like that. So, so being very true to your own brand from day one. Yeah, I think that served us really, really well. So just, just, just for our views on that. So. Uh, a typical example, Carlsberg will come in and they say, look, we want to have four taps on your bar, we'll pay to redecorate in a Carlsberg manner. Correct. And, and that's a shortcut because that's investment quickly, you know, but, but then you're kind of limited to a, a Carlsberg or a Budweiser experience. experience there. Yeah. Whereas Happy Monk, you've got quite a few different taps and that you've designed yourself. Absolutely. So the beer taps, these very beer taps you can see there. Yeah. So these were made, uh, they were bespoke made in Belgium. Right. Uh, so, you know, that wasn't cheap, right? And you're right, some of the beer companies would say, we'll put in the taps, the machines, don't worry about it. Yeah. it, it it's tempting. Uh, it's tempting to, particularly when you're small and you're a startup, yeah. um, to take advantage of you know resources that you could get. Yeah. But I'm really glad, and looking back, I think we made a really strong, a really important decision not to go down that route from day one. Were, were there um, any kind of is, sacrifices that, as a result of that? Did you have to kind of. Um, more because you were yeah, I think we probably had to work harder to bring in that initial revenue to start with. Okay. Like by paying for the beer taps or, or okay. you know, all the little things you see, all that stuff, right? Uh, so I think tied to all of this, so we opened here in 2009. Yeah. And I think a combination of what I just mentioned, uh, location, the market in Guangzhou, I think we pitched ourselves just ahead of that sort of curve in the bar business. Yeah. So we became quite popular fairly quickly. Yeah. And, you know, in, in what you might say common fashion here in Guangzhou, everyone was saying to us, oh, when you're opening your number two, you opened your number one last year, come on, you're busy now, go and open number two. But we were really adamant that we were not going to expand until we were really ready for it. When was number two? So that came five years, in 2014. Okay. And and at that, that point, no, that was in Xinjiang. Okay. And that's Xinjiang two, your second one? That's number two, yeah. Okay, and then it was Happy Valley. And then, so number two opened, and we were ready for it, and we had the systems in place, and yeah, yeah, people yeah. ready. So we, we literally kind of opened. And, Lift and shifted. Yeah, kind of thing. Uh, and then that same year, we opened number three. So we were then in a position we could start opening. Then in 2017, at the beginning of 2017, we opened number four, King, King Gold. Gold. Yeah. And then last year, one, 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 one of my favorite ones is King Gold. I yeah. Think quite a lot. It's, well, it's in a good, it's sort of in a, a very central location yeah. for offices and so on. So I think, I think the, the, the main thing for me at least, um, 
and I, you know, I know a lot of people when they talk about startup businesses, it's all about rolling out and exit strategy and blah blah blah. That's not the way we've done it. That's not me. That's not how I see this business. This is a baby that we've hatched from nothing, and we want to build up slowly, short, and steadily. And I think it's. I think our approach, by and large, is working quite well. So in, in the five happy monks that I've been to, I'm, I'm probably I'm not the only one that's been to five of them. Uh, each one has its own character, has its own set of clientele. Was that was that by design? Did you say, oh, do you know what we're going to open here? This we're going to target this specific type of market audience segment, or was that just a, a natural phenomenon where people would go? This this type of person would come to Happy Monk One. This type of person would go to Happy Monk Four. What was that by design, or was that just accidental? Uh, it wasn't by design. Uh, I think. If you actually look at the Happy Monk experience in each place, uh, it's fairly consistent in terms of you know the look and feel. Of course, our designs are not identical, but they they're part of the same family, right? Yeah. Uh, our menus are pretty much identical. Our systems, our management, our duty managers swap around. So we try to offer a kind of similar experience. To answer your question, we didn't really design it in any particular way. Uh, and I think what's happened is, so for example here, yeah. this part of town, a big chunk of our clientele, the people who live in this area of uh, uh, King Gold is more of an office type crowd. Yeah. Uh, Happy Valley is perhaps a bit more family focused. Family Especially on weekends, yeah. and, you know, you've got the kids, got a big outdoor area and yeah. so on. So, so it's sort of naturally, based on the local demographic, kind of worked out that way. I think another thing that's we didn't really plan for, and which has been fantastic from a business point of view, is we've really captured the local market here. You know, most of our, you know, well, most of our um, customers here, you know, 80, 85 percent are local Chinese. Yes. I say local meaning Chinese people, wherever they may come from. And uh, they're not our traditional expat bar. Yes. Uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with expat bars, but. It's obviously a much smaller market, so in terms of scaling, yeah. or to moving into cities where well, there are no expats, yeah. and even Guangzhou, the expat population is not that big, really. So being able to rely predominantly on the local market and appeal to the local market yeah. means we've got a much more scalable proposition. You have, you have. So I mean, I don't want to quote, name out any kind of Irish bars that I've been to, but they're, they're great for atmosphere, but they're quite mm. raucous and rawdy. But I think the clientele that comes to the Happy Mug, as you said, that. A lot of them are local, they, they get an experience of, I wouldn't say an Western, Irish pub, but a Western pub, without, without the kind of, you know, the kind of fisticuffs and all that, that mainly yeah. starts happening. Yeah. Uh, and, and what's really interesting about the Happy Monk brand is, I was talking about you guys this morning, I had a meeting this morning, and we're looking at venues. <clears throat> the Happy Monk is, is a venue that pops up in every conversation, so when I run events, and once I say, well, how about the Happy Monk? That's a, they've got five venues and it's all different. So well, again, it was that like, by design where, because you know, space is quite uh, a premium. And because you, you're designed in a way where you can have a little space like this, as an example, it caters for those types of events. Was that by design or are you kind of, is that in the back of your mind now when you, when you do your marketing? Uh, uh, it, sort of a bit of both. I think the design, you know, um, if we look at our customers, we get quite a few people coming in groups. So it could be a company dinner, it could be somebody's birthday, it yeah. could be a, you know, you talk about our marriage proposals, we get these all the time. Right? So, yeah. so yeah. people can kind of find out, hey, we're going to propose tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Can yeah. you kind of yeah. turn the music down? And... Oh, uh, can you please make sure there's no customers in here at three o'clock? Okay. Make sure you've got blooms and flowers everywhere. Okay. Yeah, that happens. We we had one just this week in party direction. Oh, wow. So proposals, we have people who on their wedding anniversaries come here for dinner every year. We've got people who propose on New Year's Eve who come back to here every year. So, um, but back more to your question. So I think, I think when we think about the design and the layout and the style, this does factor in the sort of groups and having a, a more private space, but it's not a major part of the design. In, uh, um, we also work with the actual location of the renting. Uh, okay. A lot of your design's done by Ching Ching, who Ching Ching is, uh, Jeremy's beautiful wife, and she's, she's a designer by, by, by soul, I guess, and the, the, she, she gets involved quite a lot. Yeah, she's got a really good eye for design. We work with, we work with uh, a really good friend of ours who um, help, helps fundamentally with the designs. Yeah. Uh, and Ching Ching um, 
uh, adds a lot of value to that. Yeah, and it's pretty fussy about the design. And um, we try to, I guess, we try to make a design which is authentic, yet inclusive. We're not trying to be the coolest, coolest. Okay. Or we, you know, our clientele could be family with kids, old, young, it doesn't matter where you're from. Okay. We're very inclusive. We, we totally don't want to go down the route of excluding anything. Okay. So talk about inclusive, which it, it, it's ironic that way. You're leaning against the team here. I mean, when, when we, when I talk about startups, you know, you can have a dream, but without a team, you, it's, it's pointless. You can't. You, you need a team that executes, but you need to have this certain mold and DNA about the team. I don't know that you know, team is a massive part of um, not just a service, but a part of the brand. I mean, you've got openness, you've got happiness, you've got ethics. This is stuff that corporates go into about you know, these kind of buzzwords, these values. So that's definitely by design. That's absolutely by design. So you talk about these what you call core values, yeah. openness and ethics and so on. So these, these came out of a lot of work we did with external consultants. Yeah. Didn't come from me. In fact, I didn't take part in that process personally. Okay. Only at the very, very beginning. So this was more of a team collaborative. So they, they came up with these. So they came up through these sessions with management consultants, uh, came up with you know, some of the ideas and concepts that our team felt best encapsulated who we are and what we want to be. So, and these core values, and it's, you know, I know a lot of companies, and I, you know, I know from doing the legal work, I've seen a million handbooks that talk about how wonderful we all are. Yeah. And you have to be careful that it doesn't become the latest buzzword. Yeah. But I think in our, in our case, I can say that, firstly, as I mentioned, these values were generated from within over a period of time by our team yes. and across the board of our team. And secondly, why it's really good is it helps with uh, focus our decision making. Mm. So anything we do, whether it's interview, whether it's buying a new sofa, yeah. whether it's uh, offering something on the menu, we have to run it past these things. Yeah. Are we being authentic? Yeah. You know, are we being open here? Are we being original? Are we creating happiness through what we're doing? Yeah. So um, instilling this, instilling is not quite the word, but you know, the team sort of getting to understand this over time becomes really powerful. Mm -hmm. And I hear, I hear, I hear guys in our team who are literally saying, "Well, look, that that should not work for us because we're meant to be authentic. So why are we doing that? Uh, it's yeah. not a very authentic that's, decision." That's they're the type of people that you want to employ in these things because they care. Yeah, they care. It's not a yes. job. It's just yes, not a yes, and it's not just a buzzword. It's it's coming from here. Yeah. Okay. It's of course it's not perfect. It's a work in progress. It always will be. I think, uh, you know, and this is a message I'd say to any startup. I'm going to look at the camera for that. <laughs> any, any startup here in China, or anywhere, I suppose, but in, in China uh, particularly, is you know, invest into the team. Uh, you can nurture, find fantastic people in this market, but it takes a lot of time and effort. Mm. Uh, if you look at all the business survey kind of uh, uh, polls and position papers, you know, it's always finding good people, it's always listening to all these challenges, right? Yeah. And it, I'm not saying that anywhere in the world is difficult, but what I've what I found here in China, you need to be willing to really invest exactly. into, into that team, yeah. and you can get fantastic results. Yeah. I see a lot of the young people, they're a little bit like seeds, yeah. that are just ready to be nurtured and watered in the sunshine, and they can yeah. start to blossom yeah. out. I know it's a cliche world, but... It, it, it is, I mean, one of the things that I'm finding, uh, as I grow philosophy, and, I, and, and if you listen to my other blogs, is, People want spoon feeding, they want instant gratification, but they're not willing to, to put that time and effort in. At the same time, leaders aren't willing to put that time and effort into investing it. So sometimes it's, 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 it's a zero sum game where they're just they're complaining and the leaders are complaining and this and yeah. the happy monk isn't about that. And I know that there's some pictures here where you, know, you, you take your team out. So, so they went to the UK, to Lancaster, to try some of the Lancaster beer. You fly them out to New Zealand to try the mussels. So they're really part of that process. So I think that's that's really involved really and engaging. Yeah, so. and that's and that's an area that we're constantly trying to develop. Okay. Uh, I mean, you know, how powerful, even from a marketing point of view, to be able to tell your customers that your team know where your muscles come from. Well, actually, they've been to it, and they've been to it, and they fish them out of the sea. And here's the video, and these are the muscles that you're eating today. Yeah. Yeah. Quite a nice story, right? It is. It so is. It's, it's 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 not just, a marketing gimmick. But it's, it's, no, it's, it's not a gimmick. It's truly for. It's not marketing gimmick, it's, it's authentic and it works really well. Okay, because people say, well, yeah, say, well that's, that can't be cheap. So you fly, I don't know, six, seven people out to, to New Zealand, 15 to the UK. I mean, that's on your books. That's, I mean, yeah, as a startup, that, that's quite expensive. But 
if you think in the long run, that's investment. Yeah, and look, when we, if we take five or six people to the UK or New Zealand or whatever, but firstly, we're flexible on flight dates. Yeah. You, can, you, can, you can fly in the UK for three or four thousand euros each yeah. return. Yeah. You shop around. Yeah, yeah, you can on a perfectly decent airline. Secondly, you know, our team are young, they don't expect, and we can't afford to put them in the Mandarin Hotel, yeah. but we'll stay in hospitals. When we went to Vietnam, we all stayed in hospitals together, and they loved it. Yeah. Um, that's fine, that's fine. That's, that's, that's part, part of the experience, experience. Exactly. absolutely. So our guys went to London, they were in a... When I saw where they, they booked it, and I saw it was in the back street in King's Cross, and I was like, oh, oh love love it. King's Road. King's oh, Cross. Oh, yeah, so they go, you know, King's in a like, raising road and places like that. Which, you know, in the old days, King's Cross was a bit no, dark. King's Cross is really nice now. Now, <laughs> well, they, they, came back, they came back with uh, photos of this hostel they stayed in. Yeah. They all stayed in one room, and it was brilliant. It was really, it was a really cool, cool really cool kind of buzzing, funky yeah. hostel they stayed in. They were up every morning at 5.30, they were walking around London, they were going to museums, they were going to bars, pubs, borough market, they were doing all of it, they were up there. And they wrote blogs and they sent it to us and we did posts and we shared with customers. That's great, so it, it, it's means, a it, it gives them, you know, the Happy Monk is a is non-Irish bar, it's an English, it's uh, London, London sort of exactly, so, so giving them that type of understanding of what you're working with, it really, really helps. Yeah. Just, just talking about King's Cross changing over the last decade, Guangzhou has changed in, in the last, I've been here six, this is my seventh year, I think. Mm. Has it always been plain sailing in terms of doing business there? I mean, and obviously your, your background in law and, and, and being a, a public as well. What's been the struggles, the trial and tribulations of Guangzhou without going into too much politics? Uh, so I would say, well, firstly, I would say that uh, if we look at this on a sort of macro level, yep. so Guangzhou has, if you look at the history as well, yep. always been fairly open. Yes. Uh, you know, old Canton, it was one of the windows of China to the world, yep. going back for hundreds yep. of years. Yep. You can find the oldest mosque outside of the Middle East is here in Guangzhou. I don't know if you know that. I didn't know that. You can go and visit it actually. Okay. Or you can go in. There's a fact. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll find out and put the address at the bottom here. Yeah. So, so you know, old Canton. So, Guangzhou's been home to foreign traders and foreign business for a long time. Yeah. Uh, Guangzhou's quite far from the centre, as we know. So, you know, traditionally Guangzhou has been a place where you come, you roll up the sleeves and get things done and people let you get on with it. Uh, firstly. Secondly, I think the business environment on lots of levels has improved hugely as China's developed and Guangzhou's developed. And Guangzhou's economy has grown up. 10 plus percent per annum for the last 30 years. Really? Yeah. 10 plus. Yeah. yeah, now it's slowed down a bit, but even now it's probably higher than the well, national average. Yeah. National average currently runs around six. So, whatever the number is, it's been growing, and you can yeah. just see it. You've been in six years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I've seen it change from my eyes. Yeah. I came here in 1978 the first time as a tourist. Now you're really showing your age. Now I'm really saying my age, although <laughs> I was very young then. Um, <laughs> so, back, 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 back to the question. So, um, Doing business here isn't the nightmare that some people may perceive it to be. Yeah. Things work fairly well. You know, the, the banking system works That's well, the internet is slow but it's okay. Um, the government in terms of dealing with government bureaus, if you follow the rules, yeah. it can be very bureaucratic. If you follow the rules, they're generally at our level of business no nasty surprises. Okay. Uh, there can be challenges for sure. Okay. Um, ch rules change quite quickly. Some rules are not always that. Transparent. Are you speak, speaking specifically about the, the food and beverages rules and policies, or are you talking about in general? Both. So, so in general, I would say in the last couple of years has been quite a considerable tightening up, uh, just generally on lots and lots of levels. Right. You know, even even getting my work permit has become more bureaucratic than it used to be. So, uh, and this is a perception felt by the foreign community in China for sure. So there's been a, 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 an overall sort of tightening up. Uh, on f &B specifically, yes, definitely, we get more inspections than we used to. We get the various bureaus coming in and checking this and checking that, which keeps us on our its toes. And, you know, on balance, it's not all bad. Uh, we, we want to follow the environmental rules. Yeah. Uh, it can be a bit overwhelming at times. It, so just on that point, Jeremy, you know, you, you, you read the news, and I won't talk about which news channels, but there's, there's never anything positive there to say about China. And then and a lot of it's down to health and safety, food, whatever. And, and here you are saying, 
you know, there's lots of checks and stuff. Surely it's, it's a good thing because they want to raise the bar on standards and quality. So, so the only way to do it is to make sure you're kept on your toes. Um, what do you say about that? Um, that's a big question. And yes, of course, it, it, it is definitely a good thing that they are enforcing environmental regulations, including on us. But what you might find, or what you will find often, is there is a lot of inconsistency. So a, a lot of the worst offenders continue, yeah. and then the low-hanging fruit, and we are low-hanging fruit, okay, you get and being a foreign-related business okay. means we're extra low-hanging fruit in many respects. Okay. So there is a perception that enforcement is bad. Okay. It's not consistent. Okay. There is inconsistent application points. So that is a challenge to any business. Okay. Any tips to our viewers if, if they were running an FMB and policies and consistent, what would you say? I think, I think my tip, I mean, my, probably my biggest message, single message from all of this is, firstly, China's not an easy market. Yeah. It just isn't. Uh, secondly, to, having said that, there are enormous opportunities here for sure. And people, there are people who do very well in this market. Uh, thirdly, I think, and the key point is, unless you're willing to really invest your time, resources, your passion, your heart yeah. into this market, you're going to find it really tough here. Okay. So you need to really make that decision. I've, in my legal career, I see lots of opportunist small businesses from yeah. different countries that they think are coming to the China market and making a lot of money, but yeah. we're not really willing to leave New Zealand or England or America or wherever it is, because yeah. we have a pretty comfortable life here. Who, who wants to get on planes and go to China? We've got people on the ground who can do it. And they keep they don't keep their eye on the ball, they don't invest. Okay. And by invest I don't just mean financially, but in every sense. Yeah. And you know, we talked about building a team earlier. Yeah. You know, you, and when, when you're managing a your team remotely, that lends itself to even more kind of overall investment being required. Yeah. And so a lot of companies that I've seen in the past, including reputable companies, they sort of set up in China because they feel they have to be here. Yeah, and, then, and, then and they kind of, yeah, yeah oh, we don't like it here and it's difficult yeah. and people aren't easy and you can't recruit people. And, what you said earlier about government and this and that, that's the feeling they get. Then it screws up and then they blame all of that rather than themselves. Sometimes, yeah, if something goes wrong, you're in. Yes. As, as an entrepreneur, if something screws up, it's just sort of your problem. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, I'm not, I, I want to be clear, I'm not saying uh, foreign companies are stupid and it's all their fault. You do have to deal with a lot of challenges here in this market. But what I would say, a recurring theme is that. A lot of companies, especially small and medium-sized enterprises, they're not willing or they're unable to really make that investment in the wider sense of the world. Okay. And what I'd say to them is, this might not be the right market. Okay. So talk, talking about markets, that's a really good point. So I've recently joined the British Chamber of Commerce as an executive committee member. You're the chairman, and, and, and Jeremy started the... the not, no, no, I didn't, I didn't start did, it, did start I, I, I got involved at quite an early stage. Yeah, an early stage, yes. okay. And then yes. has that helped? So, you know, if someone wants to come in, will the chambers help you uh, in that sense? I know there's a consulate here, but then, what, what's the purpose of the chamber? Why are you involved for so many years? I think, uh, firstly, uh, you know, chambers of commerce are quite common all around the world, right? Yep. Okay. Uh, I think the British Chamber sort of grew as a result of an increasing uh, level of trade and investment between the UK and China, and right. one North and China. Okay. So that's sort of the background, right. uh, the economic background. And, you know, in the early days, the Chamber was a good forum for people to meet up for a pint and just yeah, have a chat about yeah. how things are going. Okay. It's now become a bit more formal and a bit yep. more structured. Okay. And through, as you know, we, we run, 50, 60 events a year of some description. So it's it's a great network to tap into if you're new here. And like I say, almost like anything in life, you get out of it what you put in. If if companies are willing to really leverage, uh, what, uh, really contribute to the chamber and leverage what can be, be offered, it can, yeah. it can become a very useful forum. So when I was developing my business in, in my old law firm, yeah. you know, the chamber network was really, really helpful. Okay. So would you say advice to anyone that's you know, start up early stage or mediums or mature businesses to join up to a chamber. It doesn't have to be the chamber of your country. Ideally, it should be, but to join because of the network and opportunities that that oh, could bring. Without doubt. Without you doubt. Know, pay a, frankly, a small. Uh, In the grand scheme of things. Yeah. Grand scheme of things, it's, you know. 
It's an anti type of yes. cost okay. uh, for a year's membership, and that plugs you into sort of, you know, all sorts of potential networks. And no, it doesn't have. I mean, in, in this globalized world, what does what a what does a British company in England do today? Well, is Rolls Royce British? Yes, yes, yes and no. I mean, it, it it's doesn't. It's happy Mongolian stay British. I know your wife is from China. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's a good question. So, so uh, at the moment, you know, we're starting to look at potential opportunities outside of Hong We think this model could work in other parts. Yeah, absolutely. You can lift and shift it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how we do go about that is, you could set up your own places. You could do something yeah. like a franchise, find partners, do joint ventures. So we're looking at these various options at the moment. So it dove, 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 dovetails into the, the kind of final couple of questions of what is. What's the, what's the future of Happy Mom? What's the future of, of Jeremy in, in nine, uh, 2019, 2020? What is, what's the outlook for you? Because I, I, I know you've just done an EMBA. The EMBA. Uh, and and are you going to start applying some of that knowledge into your business model and you guys, as, as a person, as an entrepreneur? Yeah, so the EMBA was really useful, especially yeah. for somebody who's never studied you know, quantitative yeah. subjects and accounting. And Stuff that you don't like doing. Something I don't like, I'm not good at, yeah. I've never studied before. So it, it really forced me to buckle down and learn some of that And getting outside of China for that program, it was intensive. There was a lot of traveling, a lot of face-to-face -face classroom time yeah. every single month. But it was, you know, it was a really disciplined, Process and, and get your head down. The three words that were described in the MBA. So this is an executive MBA, isn't the normal run? Because the MBA is quite normal now, and EMBA is probably the new thing. So three words that will sum up your experience of an EMBA, um, your EMBA. The three words. Uh, one is uh, sheer graft. That's two words, but yeah, yeah. Graft. You know, sticking at it. Graft. Yeah. Uh, travel. Travel. And. Uh, Learning, learning, yeah, yeah. Big, big, big learning. Big, big, big. Well, not learning. just. I mean, remember, it wasn't just the material, but also learning about other people as well. Other people, other countries. countries. Uh, you start to learn. It's quite a satisfying process to start knowing what you didn't even know before. Yeah, it opens up whole it's areas. Kind of of being born every every time yeah. you go to a module. Yeah, okay. and we did, and there's some just amazing modules on the course. You okay. know, slightly off the off the wall stuff in okay. some of the elective subjects. Okay. We did this uh, course called Napoleon's Glass, yeah. which was all about intuitive decision making. So okay. a whole gut feeling type stuff. Yeah, sort of gut feeling, sort of Napoleon style, you know, how did Napoleon succeed? Okay. It wasn't through meticulous business plans. Yeah, through experience. And it was, it was all about drawing, drawing moments from history, okay. sort of combining them into this flash of inspiration and then moving forward. Yeah. Okay. And um, you know how Starbucks began. I think uh, Howard Schultz was in Milan, uh, in, a, in a neighborhood, Milan, Italian friendly family coffee shop for work. Suddenly thought, you know, the US has got all the, everything else, but that sort of friendly barrister, uh, barista kind of culture, and everyone queuing up and chatting, and the smell of coffee and didn't exist in the US. So there was this sudden moment of bringing everything together. Yeah. And that was how Starbucks, as we know, was born. Yeah. In, in Napoleon's glass. So yeah. philosophy was like Napoleon's glass of, you know, there isn't enough people learning and, and to, to, to experiment and do and to, hey, why don't I go out and do this? To, to kind of spread the seed. Well, okay. well, the professor, last point on this, but you know, the pr professor who's created this course, and it's a pretty pretty unique course, I'm happy to share it too. Um, I mean, you know, he, he, he was saying, and I agree, there's very little original, truly original ideas. Just about everything we all do is an, is an innovation or spin-off of something that somebody's done. So the ability to be able to pick out examples from history, yeah. because you know yesterday was history, and bring them all together and yeah. suddenly get this kind of new new thing. So exactly. So as, in terms of innovation, nothing is really new according to to not, not, not very few things. things. I mean, how many, how many Einstein's have there been? You know, how many industrial true industrial revolutions have there been? Yeah. You know, they're, they're obviously in history there are people who create something absolutely brand new from scratch, but okay. it's not been very complicated. Right. So, so you said two thousand and nine is so ten years, this is ten years. So we're, we're just So apart from a, a mega super party here yes. for your decade anniversary, what else is coming up for you and everyone? Uh, so I think we are continuing, this is this is another point about food and beverage generally, I guess, any business, but I think here in this business, 
you just have to constantly improve yeah. on a daily basis. How can we do something a bit better? How can we get better quality glasses? Yeah. How can we um, uh, improve our food menu, uh, uh, our music system? It's, so, so we carry on with this. We are uh, going to be introducing new menus, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, live music. Uh, so lots of ideas like that on a sort of operational level. In the longer, bigger picture sense, uh, I think we would be looking at expansion oh, outside. Outside of Bronco, okay. yeah. Okay. Probably, probably in second tier cities. Okay, cool. Yeah. So you've heard from Jeremy, in terms of 2019, 2020, you know, people expect them to say, well, we're going to do this, and we're going to build this. And we're... It's nice, just kind of keeping the kind of stuff the way it is, but just better, right? constantly raising the bar, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. rather than you know massive leaps. I don't think you need the massive leaps. It's not the case. Okay. Uh, okay. I think incremental improvement is. There are situations where, of course, you need to. If there's a change in strategy, yeah. you need to restructure. Okay. But if you are on a fairly you know, understood path, I think the incremental approach, and it's also easier to do. Okay. It's easier to get the team on board. For that. Cool. Right, so, so lastly, very last, I don't want you to pitch, you know, the happy monk, because everyone knows, and if you come to Guangzhou, you, you'll definitely find it. Uh, so, sub tips for anyone that's watching in terms of wanting to start a business, or coming to China, or moving careers from, from law to FMB, what would be your three tips, very quickly, Jeremy? Uh, so, I think my, I, I this is going to sound a bit cliche, right? So, I think the first thing is, um, don't be scared. If you, if you don't, if you don't do something, you never know how it goes. Right. To do it, right. Just do it, as Mike was saying. It's it's really important. To do is to know it. Um, correct. Exactly that. To so do it. Um, and look, in many many cases, I'm not advocating sort of recklessness, no plan, just jump in and see what happens. But in most cases, worst case scenario, something doesn't work. It's not the end of the world. So I would say, just go for it. Secondly, don't work, don't put money as your focus, because even if you love money, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you make money your focus, you miss out on the journey, and you miss out on something. In terms of the, the purpose of the business? Yes, the purpose of the, yes. The idea. Focus on what you like doing. So if you want to set up your own business, if you love going to the gym, think about the fitness business. If you love people, do something like hospitality. If you love technology, you don't want to be in a... Uh, Sitting behind a desk. Sitting behind a desk, yeah. So, so doing what you love, make it your calling, your life. Um, be prepared to work really hard. Is that the third point? The third point is hard work. There's hard no, work. There's no, it's not shortcuts. All about hard. There's no shortcuts. There isn't. Right? Whatever people might say, the people who have succeeded in just about everything, have put in there. Okay. They've earned their stripes, right? They have, yeah. Do you, do you agree? No, with that? Completely. Yeah, some people want to leave from. Yeah. In a fast-growing environment like here, there is a mentality. Yeah. Of, yeah if you it, here, 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 here. Very quickly. Yeah. And this is the spoon feeding now. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to climb to the summit of Everest, you're going to have to do a hell of a lot of work before you even go to base camp, right? Yes, absolutely. And even once you're there, your battle is only just starting. Yes. So I would, I would say, having said that. People can also over hate this point as well. I mean, it's not just, it's about working smart as well. It's not just yeah. getting yourself working and getting yourself. No, no, I agree. I agree. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, you know, that's that's Jeremy. That's, you know. Thanks, Will. Wise guy that, you know, you know, if everyone's talking from me, I know that you're a mentor. I mean, and I always say this in each of these video blogs is, you know, to be successful, um, it'd be great if you had a mentor and if you had a great wife or husband. I think, you know, you're a mentor to, to many and your great husband to Ching Ching. Uh, and, and I'll leave it on those kind words, Jerry. Thank, thank you for you. your time. Thanks very much, Will. Good uh, to see you. And thank you for watching and uh, leave any comments to where you're subscribing and hopefully we'll have a new and sexy entrepreneur about here next time on Willosophy Video Log. Thank you. Bye bye. Cheers. Thanks.